to be here with you this this evening, and I think we're, we've got a very serious set of subjects in front of us. This evening is anxiety, and I'm ready to go with this. Are you ready to go? Here we go. One, I, Skip isn't in here, but oh, he is. There he is. I just wanted to thank you, Skip, for inviting me once again to uh, work with you, and thank you for refresher on, as I mentioned earlier, Saturday Night Live. It's always <laughs> an experience being with you. So thank you so much for your insight and your humor. It's inimitable, that's for sure. And thanks to that being inimitable, I won't even try to be funny tonight because <laughs> it'll fall flat. Anyway, let's, let's take a moment in prayer. Father, thank you for enabling us to take a look at some of the most serious problems we face in this journey through this world. And anxiety is certainly one of the most devastating. I pray that you would help me to communicate very clearly to your people gathered here. And maybe there are even some who are not your people that they would hear and see the answer in Jesus Christ. Give me wisdom and uh, give your people an open hearts and minds to hear and to apply these things to their lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Anxiety is a terrible problem, and it's a terrible problem for Christians, and it's a terrible problem for non-Christians alike. Psych psychiatric hospitals and psychotherapist offices, they're, they're filled, and we know this, they're filled with people who are ripped up, who are torn apart by anxiety. See, anxiety just tears you down. It rips you to pieces. It prevents you from living the life that you could live best for God. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, we read, the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worries, that is the worries or the anxieties of the world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. In other words, the worries that are all around you, the worries that are in your life, the difficult things that are affecting you, afflicting you might even say, all these choke your ability to live a Christ-centered and a word-centered, a scripture-centered life. This is the extent and this is the power that anxiety can have on you. Being anxious can destroy your life. Living with anxiety can be a, a life destroyer. But what exactly is anxiety? Anxiety is a concern. But it's a concern, you see, about something specific. It's a concern about the future. It's a concern about what hasn't yet taken place. So you can't have anxiety about what you've already gone through, what's already in the past. You can have regrets about the past. You may have trouble with the outcomes and the consequences of your past actions, but you can't be anxious about it. You can be anxious about what might happen because of what you did in the past, but you can't be anxious about the past because the past doesn't exist anymore. It's over. What you worry about are the things that you think are going to take place in the future. We often think that by being anxious about something we think is going to happen, we will somehow lessen the impact that it's going to have on us. But when we belong to Jesus Christ, God shows us the uselessness of all such anxiety. In Luke chapter 12, verse 25, Jesus says, which of you, by being anxious, can add a single moment to your life? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 34, we read, therefore do not be anxious for tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough anxiety, trouble, cares, of its own. But how are you to guard against being anxious in your life? How are you to stop being anxious? And what are you to do instead? I want you to learn the principles to deal with anxiety in a way that will enable you to honor and glorify God. That's what I want you to get from this tonight, so that you're going to know how to effectively deal with the concerns of your life. So in this context, I want us to first look at, number one, the meaning of anxiety. The word anxiety means to divide, to rip, to tear apart. 
to distract, as in distracting one's attention from something. That's what the word means. And how anxiety manifests itself is as a concern for what's going to happen to you in the future. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking about looking ahead, seeing that you need to prepare for the future, or provide for your family for the future. It's about seeing what's going to happen in the future and being impacted and torn apart by what you think may, and you never know if it's going to actually happen anyway. So I'm, you see, not saying that providing for your family and being concerned that your family's taken care of in the future is wrong, not at all. That's not anxiety. Anxiety is the preoccupation with what may happen in the future. And to be totally preoccupied about these things, to be consumed by them, is anxiety. And anxiety is wrong. Before I came to faith in Jesus, I was a very, very anxious person. I grew up in a family, and you're going to understand why I was anxious in about 10 seconds. You'll hear why. In my family, all of the men died of heart attacks in their 40s. Oh, wait a minute, I'm turning 40 tomorrow. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm sorry, Skip. <laughs> but, uh, and I was really anxious about this. Believe me, I was really anxious about this. I felt that I had to live an entire life, apart from being heartbroken by it. I love my family, I mean, my uncles and my dad. I felt I had to live my entire 40 years in uh, twice the speed that it would normally take everyone else to do it, I, because I figured I'm given half the time. So I was continually anxious about this. Even to the point, think about this, of going through a six or seven year doctoral program covered by scholarship, the whole thing, living and everything else, even vacations wound up being covered. I just felt I had to get through it, through it, and I did it. And I, I remember I walked into the, my advisor's office. He was telling me about the program that I was accepted in. I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. No, I'm not going to do it in six. I'm going to do it. I got to get out of here in three. And I did. I, I, I don't really remember what I did during those three years. I don't remember anything. It was hard because I was trying to fight against what I saw as the limitation of my life and what I had to do to experience two lives in, in the time of one. I was torn up all the time. I was missing today by focusing entirely on tomorrow. I was constantly rushing through life, terrified that I wasn't going to live long enough to enjoy it. And the result was that I, I wound up not enjoying anything. I remember once while I was in graduate school, I was talking with friends of mine and I said to them, man, I am really looking forward to, to the fall this year. And they looked at each other a bit strange and one of them looked at me and said, it's winter, Rich, the fall's over. And I, I, was, I was stunned by that. I just, I stood there for a minute. I'd been so preoccupied. When my wife first came, visited me, I won't even, no, forget that. But, uh, yeah, I used to, well, I used to have the windows covered. You couldn't see out. I didn't want to have time interfering with my life. Everything was dark and blackened out, light, dark, didn't matter. Clocks, I did, I tried not to run clocks, alarm clocks. I would try and just live by a pace that, you know, transcended or went beyond time. Oh, you're looking at me like, who's this wacko talking to me? <laughs> it's me, so don't look at me like that. No, it's okay. Uh, what I, didn't realize was that I was missing everything that's right in front of me now. What happens is when you're living with anxiety, you wind up missing your life. That's what you miss. It just passes you by because you're focused somewhere else. You're not focused on living. You're focused on some other things. You're focused on things that ha you have no control over and that might never ever happen. So in the second place, knowing what anxiety is, what does God command us concerning anxiety? L listen now. Listen to Jesus in Matthew 6, 25 through 34. Therefore I say to you, do not worry about your life, about what you're going to eat or what you're going to drink. Don't worry about your body, what you're going to wear. It's not, it's not life more than food or the body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not more, worth more value than they? Which of you by worrying, now that's twice already in that section, a few verses, can add one moment to his life. So why do you worry? That's a third time. Why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor they sp do they spin. Yet I say to you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of those flowers. Now if God clothes the grass of the field like that, which is today is and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? Therefore, do not worry. That's the fourth time saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For all these things the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. So seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry. That's the fifth time about tomorrow, because tomorrow will worry about itself. Number six. Each day it ends has enough trouble of its own. So you have here in one short paragraph six times that Jesus uses the word worry or anxiety. Clearly, he's teaching us something about anxiety. In fact, in the six times that the word worry is used, three times Jesus is saying, do not worry, and three times the idea is, but if you're already worrying, make sure to stop it. So don't even do it. But if you are, stop what you're doing. It's a command over and over again, six times in one paragraph. And the argument for why you're not to worry is this. If God has given you life, if God has made you, if God has saved you, isn't he going to take care of you? You see, Jesus is saying that since you must not set your heart on earthly, tre earthly treasures, and since you must choose God over all the treasures and over all the things of the world, therefore stop worrying, stop being consumed by all that's connected with your life and your body. In other words, the things that you worry about are the things that relate to your daily life. And Jesus is saying that since you're not to let yourself focus that way, therefore don't even begin to worry about any of these things. You see, it's really an issue of what you believe. It comes down to an issue of faith. Do you believe that God will really take care of you? See, that's the real question. Do you believe that? Think about what a ridiculous thing it is if you don't believe that God's going to take care of you. We, as believers, believe that God is going to take care of us for eternity, that we're going to live forever in the presence of God, and we're, we're living as unbelievers when it comes to our lives on this earth doesn't make sense. We're committed to the fact that he's going to do the greater thing for us, but we're totally agnostic when it comes to believing whether he's going to take care of us day by day in this world. And it's more than just a theological status, being an agnostic. It means that it's going to affect your entire life of faith. That means it's going to affect your entire life. God wants you to realize that you're to make sure that your priorities are right. And the main priority for you to have is this. In your life, you are to be seeking first his kingdom. You're to seek first God and his kingdom. And so the message to you is this. Seek God's kingdom first and don't be anxious about anything. Refuse to choose anxiety because, friends, it's a choice. It's a choice. If I can choose at a certain moment in my life that I stopped being anxious about the thing that had gripped me from the days I saw my family dying, and one of them, my dad, right in front of me. Anxiety, in 1 Peter 5, 7, Peter speaks about anxiety, saying, cast all your worries, your anxieties, your cares, on him because he cares for you. See, Peter is telling you that the Lord wants you to give to him your cares, your anxieties, because he has commanded you not to worry. And you know what this means? This means that whenever you choose to worry, you're choosing what? You're choosing to sin. And I know, I mean, I'm aware that it sounds harsh to speak that way about it. 
it, it seems, it sounds, even to me, it sounds harsh that the choice of worry is a choice of sin, but I'm not being harsh. You see, here is God. God speaks the world into existence. God parts the Red Sea. God delivers his people onto dry land. God raises Lazarus from the dead. God changes the eternity, of, the eternal destiny of, of a soul. Our God does all these things, and this means that we can trust him, really trust him with the concerns of our heart and the concerns of our life. See, God isn't dismissing your concerns. They are real concerns. God knows you. God accepts you. You can trust your concerns to him and not carry them around and let them tear you to pieces. In 1 Peter, Peter is dealing primarily with suffering. And he's preparing God's people for trials and for troubles, for difficulties. He's saying that there are going to be serious trials. There are going to be real difficulties. There's going to be suffering that comes with following Jesus. But he has one last thing that he desires to warn God's people about as they face inevitable, satanic, fiery ordeals. And interestingly enough, that last thing is anxiety. Friends, you see, make no mistake about it. The life that you live is marked by cares in this world. Peter is not saying there are no cares. Don't let there be cares in this life. See, there you are. Life is marked by cares. Life is marked by trouble. Life is marked by sorrows. And becoming a Christian does nothing to remove them. If anything, some of you, like me, may have found that the troubles actually get worse. Coming to faith in Jesus Christ doesn't lessen the disappointments or the troubles. And that should never be the hope of a true believer. I'm, I'm a believer now. Let me not have trouble anymore. Thank you, God. I know that I can go through life without trouble if I have enough faith. No, you're going to be faithless if you think that. Peter also does not suggest that there is going to be some kind of magical remedy for your anxiety. Rather, Peter honestly admits that the future of the people of God involves troubles and difficulties. But in facing trouble in Jesus, you will find that it is a trouble that you can cope with. And you can cope with it because of one main reality. God cares for you. The trouble doesn't go away. The difficulty does not lessen. The sorrow does not disappear, but God cares for you through it all. That's why I think, remember the incredible statement in Romans 5, uh, tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance brings about proven character, and proven character brings about hope, and hope does not disappoint because of the Holy Spirit who was given to you. But what's interesting about that little section there in Romans 5 is, he doesn't say tribulation brings about the end of it. it. It brings about the change of your character. If we understand that God wants to see our characters changed, then we understand that the way it's done is through trouble, facing trouble and facing it biblically in a godly way. So what it boils down to is this. Peter is dealing here not with the problem of suffering or the problem of persecution, but with the problem of the mind, your mind, your thinking, your attitude. It's all the same word there. As you face troubles, how do you, with your mind, deal with those troubles? And those troubles of the mind that Peter is dealing with are anxieties. What Jesus wants you to know is that you are to face these troubles by trusting him. The main thing to see is not that in Christ troubles are going to disappear, but that in Christ you can face troubles with trust, not with anxiety. Anxiety will never, ever help you through the trouble. But God will. God is going to continually take care of you through whatever troubles you're ever going to face. Which leads us to ask, in the third place, what are the causes of anxiety? What are the causes? 
In Matthew 6.34, that I just read a few moments ago, anxiety is allowing your mind, yes, that's right, allowing it, choosing it, to stay in the future with, with a host of things that you call realities, but that you can do nothing about now. It's caused by a preoccupation for your life. Now, I'm sure that there are countless people that are just as preoccupied with themselves as I was in trying to outsmart a young death. Imagine thinking about, I mean, this is the way I live, trying to think about living two lives in the space of one. I can tell you that following my conversion, that anxiety-ridden experience was completely gone. I can't really explain it. I knew my life was hidden with Christ and God. I knew it. That's the best explanation I can give. That deep anxiety about dying young was gone. I never even had to consciously work on it in my case. Now, you see my gray hair and everything like that, you think I'm an old guy, really, but that's all for me. I'm only 29. That's just from being anxious. <laughs> see, that's what it does. Gets you gray early. I never even really, I don't remember a single moment consciously thinking, I've got to now as a Christian deal with this. It was over. Coming to faith in Christ for me meant eternal life. I knew that I was going to live forever, and I just stopped being concerned about trying to cram in as much as possible into these moments and trying to get as long a life as possible. Instead, I, I started to focus on living how God wanted me to live now, today, actually each moment. That became my focus. That became my concern and interest and absorption, and in a sense, almost obsession, a biblical obsession of being conformed to Christ. And as an unlooked for benefit, enabled me to become a person who enjoyed whatever moment I was in. Once you stop being consumed with the future, once you stop being preoccupied with the cares about your life, the present moment becomes something you can enter into and use for God and enjoy God in. A second cause of anxiety is in Matthew 6.32 where we read, all these things the Gentiles seek. That's another cause of anxiety. Not being a Gentile, that's not a cause, necessarily a cause of anxiety. But uh, the things which, in other words, those who are unbelievers, the goyim, the nations, those who do not belong to Jesus Christ, and that could be Jew or Gentile. All these things which people are seeking after and being anxious about if they don't have these things, that's what it's about. People are anxious about not having the best things, the right things, all things, all the things their neighbors have, their friends have. God tells you that this is not to be your focus. Desiring something is not, in and of itself, it's not sinful. But if you make obtaining that thing your consuming goal, then it's, it's sinful. God says, He's given you everything you need. Everyone in this room today has everything they need for this day. I know it. I can see it. He says that in 2 Peter 1.3. You are not to be anxiously pursuing things. A third cause of anxiety is a lack of faith. You don't really believe what Paul teaches in Romans 8.32, that God who did not spare his own son but delivered him up for us all will also freely give us all things in him. You see, Paul's argument is this. If you believe the greater, that God gave up his son for you, why won't you believe the lesser? As I, I mentioned it earlier, the same idea, that God is going to take care of you and he's going to take care of you now. If you believe that God gave his life for you and gave his life for you to have life forever, why wouldn't you believe that God really will take care of your life in the way that's best in his providence? And it may not be the way you view as best right now. And, if, and number four, I want to move on to the results of anxiety. The results of anxiety. Anxiety is so all-encompassing that it produces physical, 
and spiritual destruction because it tears you up. It consumes you. It consumes your time. It consumes your attention, your thoughts, your life. Soon you're on medication. Listen on television what it says about the anxiety and panic medications. They, you know, one of the, sim one of the side effects of the, of the anxiety medication, you know what it is? This, should, may be, this may be a surprise to you. Anxiety. And I'm wondering, why in the world? It's like with the um, antidepressants. It's, you, you, you watch it on TV. They tell you the, the side effects. You can read it in the physician's desk reference on the, uh, the drugs. But they'll, say, they'll tell you right there on television. They'll say, one of the side effects is suicidal thoughts and potential suicide. I'm thinking, oh, that's cool. One of the things you get when you take an antidepressant is to kill yourself. I mean, this, seriously, I mean, this, we are encompassed by these cares that press us down, the worries, the, the anxieties, the despairs, and we're looking, we're looking, give me something to take care of it immediately. We're not looking to look to him who loves us. And I'm not, I'm not talking about an argument about medication here. That's not my intention. My intention is we're not looking where we need to look first and foremost when we're facing these kinds of dilemmas. People, you see, who have and live anxiety-ridden lives have conditioned their minds to focus on the things that are problematic, on the things that they're uncertain about, on the things in the future. They live on that level. That's the level they're living on. How can they have peace? How can they have joy? It removes them from the present. It removes them from today, where you do have and where you can exercise spirit-given self-control and where you can experience joy. He gives us this. He wants us th for this to be our lives. Skip mentioned it in, in his message a few moments ago. Anxiety removes you to a future which you can't control, and you can't control it at all, to a future which you may not even have. You wind up missing today because you're consumed with a future that may never come. It winds up being a life of presumption because you may not have that future that you're living for. You may not have more than, you know what, right now. If I told you, if I had time and I would do it, I can't now, but to tell you the people I dealt with and spoke to, to them about their hearts and their lives as they stood in front of me, as they're worrying about tomorrow and the next day, and, and, some, and one or two of them actually dying that very day. Instead of being prepared to meet God, they were fighting against God because of an unknown future that they didn't even have. And fifth, the defeat of anxiety. The defeat of anxiety. In, in Matthew chapter 6, verses 26 and 28, God says that he takes care of the birds of the air, takes care of the flowers of the field. So will he not take care of you? Here's the question that you have to ask. Will being anxious change your situation? Can it possibly change anything about your situation? No. Three times God commands you, have no anxiety. In verse 25, 31, and 34 of Matthew 6. What does it mean to have no anxiety? Well, since anxiety means to be torn apart, distracted, divided, then to have no anxiety means to be single purpose, to be single-minded in serving God. God says in Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first. In other words, to defeat anxiety, make God first in your life, not your troubles, not your cares, not your life, not your body. Additionally, to defeat anxiety, once you've done all that you can do today to prepare for it or to resolve a situation, don't be weighed down. Don't be burdened by a situation that you can't at that particular time come near resolving. If you can resolve a situation, work at it. Resolve it. If you can't resolve it right then, if all you can do is brood over it and let it tear you apart, stop it. Instead, give it over to God in prayer. So what does all of this mean? It means that if you belong to Christ, you are never to be anxious about your life. You are never to be anxious about your body. You are never to be so preoccupied about something that is happening in your life 
that it takes you away, actually takes you, winds up taking you away from serving God. God cares for you. God cares for you continually. And you know why he cares for you? He cares for you because he loves you. God uses two examples in this passage in Matthew 6. He provides food and shelter for the birds. And he splendidly arrays the lilies of the field. He clothes them in beauty. Jesus' argument in both cases is this. Neither of these, neither the birds nor the flowers, have any significance when they're compared to you. So won't God do something so much more for you? That's the essence of his argument. In the sixth place, I think I need to insert a, somewhat of a caveat when speaking of anxiety. When you think about anxiety, you often think that the answer is simply to be anxiety free. People who are anxious will say to me, I'll do anything to be free of anxiety. And I think we need to be really careful about thinking that way. I counseled a man whose father was one of the under secretaries of state in the US, which is the country I'm in right now. He was a young man, uh, well, I, I live in Canada, that's why I'm, so I'm not, mm, never mind. I'm actually American too, I'm two, two countries, dual citizen, so. Is that great? It is, yeah. yeah. So I was, I, had, I counseled this under secretary of state's son, a young man had grown up with amazing privilege. I was stunned listening to him talk to me about his life. Unlimited money, unlimited women, unlimited parties, unlimited everything, everything that he could have. This man came to me and said, I am the most anxious person you're ever going to meet in your life. Everything would be perfect in my life except I have this anxiety. He treated it like a person that came upon him that he had no control over. So I said, so you've come to me to help you be free of anxiety. And he said, that, that's correct. And I replied, well, I'm not sure I'm going to do that. He said, well, I'm here because I've been told that you can do that. I said, you know, that's correct, I can. But I'm not going to. Now I'm sure of it, I'm not going to. And he said, why? Why wouldn't you if you could? I answered, because apart from however conscious you are of your anxiety or not, not why you're anxious, you have every reason in the world to be anxious. The good things you have in your life have not removed your anxiety. The bad things that you think are good have not removed your anxiety. Nothing has removed your anxiety. The benefits that you've received from a wealthy and influential father have not removed your anxiety. And you know what that tells me? It tells me that you have every reason in the world to be really anxious. Now, the look on his face was astounding to me. He looked at me, and in a sense it was interesting because at that point something began to click with this man. Something was making sense to him. He didn't know what that was, but something in what I was saying was connecting with him. And he said, well, what do you think it is? And I said to him, you have every reason to be anxious because you are lost. You're without God and you're without hope in this world. And that comes from the Bible from Ephesians chapter two, verse 12. And he said, you're right, you're right. When that man left after talking with me that day, he left as a believer in Jesus Christ. I saw him for quite a while after that. And that's the basis, though, upon which the anxiety is to be destroyed. He began looking at every single thing in his life differently from his relationship to his father. What he expected from his father to make his life joyful and anxiety-free. What he expected from women to make his life ex exciting and anxiety free. Nothing did it. And suddenly he was finding every week after I met with him, he was, when he came in, he would say to me, I don't seem to have that problem. He wasn't even sure why, because it was hard for him to just attribute it to, to knowing Christ. But it shouldn't be hard because that's what knowing Christ brings. That's what knowing Christ is all about. That's what Christ does. He removes these things from us when he gives us a new life with a new heart. 
and a new mind. So, see, people are anxious. If you're anxious here, you know something? You're anxious for a good reason. Often it's because a person is lost. Often it's because a person's without hope, because they have no Christ in their life. You see, there was a good underlying reason for the anxiety in my life before coming to Christ. I think I would have been terribly anxious, even though if I, if I had come from a family where all the men tended to live to 100 years old instead of 40-something. I think I would have been that way anyway because I was without any real hope as far as hope goes. It seemed impossible to me that everything a person is, this is one of the things I wrestled with, should just be finished in whatever it was, whether it was 40 years, 60 years, or 80 years, all of it was like an insult to my understanding of, of life. It just seemed to me to make no sense, and it hurled me into existentialism, into a sense that life is utterly meaningless. That's the way I was seeing things. That was the way I lived. That's the way I faced everything, everything in my life. Everything was meaningless. It didn't matter what I did, what I didn't do. All I could do was make a choice for something. It didn't matter even what the choice was. If nothing mattered, it didn't matter what I did. I, I lived that way until Jesus Christ entered into my life and showed me, no, your whole philosophy is wrong. Your thinking is wrong. Your concerns are wrong. Your thoughts about the future are wrong. You don't have to be concerned about the future. You don't have to be concerned about your life. You don't have to be concerned about the length of your life. You don't have to be concerned about anything like that because life in me is far more than simply your length of life on earth. But without Jesus Christ, you and any other person has every reason to be anxious. Number seven, I want us to take a look at the alternative to anxiety. See, when you belong to Jesus Christ, you don't have to be anxious about whether or not you're able to keep your life going. When God declares that your days in the flesh are over, nothing that you can do will add one breath to your life. Your life is in God's hands, and he cares for you. You did not start your life. You are not to stop your life. Your life belongs to him, and you need to seek provision from God, especially in perilous times. You're called to live today and to live it with confidence, with courage, with joy, with freedom in the Lord. In the Lord. If you live consumed with things, if you live consumed about your life, about your body, and you do make it to old age, I think you're going to despise the decision that you made. And that's what you're gonna find it was, a decision to live anxiously for all that can only rob and all that can only plunder you. Jesus declares in verse 25 of Matthew 6 that life is more than all of these things. And what is more important than life is faith. You want to have greater faith. You wanna have greater faith so that you can serve you want to have greater faith so that you can love and enjoy God and display your confidence in God. These are the things that life is all about. Remember that when you possess faith in Jesus Christ, you're both known and loved by God. And when you know God, and you know that God knows you, that God personally and intimately cares for you, you need never, ever be anxious. The alternative to anxiety is simple. It's to live one day at a time for God. God says that this moment and this day has all the trouble that you can handle. You are finite, and you have a finite ability to deal with things, any things. The only thing that you can really deal with decisively is the trouble of today. Today is the only moment that you know for sure that God has given you. And just as in Luke 12, you can find that this night, your soul is required by God. How can you be ready for God today if you're consumed with anxious cares about tomorrow? By the way, I highly recommend that every one of you gets a copy, and you can get it right off the, the net and download it, 
of Jonathan Edwards' 70 resolutions. It's not 70 chapters, it's just little power. He had big resolutions, but it was only a couple of sentences. And here's one of them. I will endeavor to never do anything now which I would never do were it the last day of my life. I can tell you this, knowing Jonathan Edwards pretty well, that's how old I am, I go back all the way there. I feel like I know him intimately. Knowing him pretty well, I can tell you this, he meant it, he lived it that way. He lived it that way. And if we live by that resolution, if you take just that one resolution, It'll help keep us from anxiety by causing us to focus on today for God. <clears throat> Lastly, I want us to look at the replacement of anxiety because you can't just stop something. You have to replace it with something else. In Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9, we read these words. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men, for the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything. By prayer and supplication, along with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are good, if there's any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things, the things you have learned and received and heard and seen. And listen to what he says, how far he goes. And seen in me. He's making himself an example of how to live today for Jesus. Things you've learned and heard and received and seen in me, these things do, and the God of peace will be with you. This passage presents an exceptional and outstanding antidote for anxiety. The context is actually even more interesting. It's rejoicing. Some people will say very quickly, it's very hard to rejoice because I don't feel like rejoicing. And I, in fact, I would be a hypocrite if I started to rejoice when I feel like this. Yeah, you feel like you want to continue being a mess the rest of your life. That's what it is. That's what I see counseling all the time. Almost a proud attempt. I'm going to be like this forever. You can't make me be any way different. Okay, I won't. Want to be miserable? Well, you're not going to be miserable with me after today. I'm not going there if that's where you want to stay. Stay there. But it's sinful, it's awful, it's disgusting. This passage is not speaking about the emotion of <laughs> joyfulness. It's speaking about rejoicing in the Lord. In other words, the object of our rejoicing is Jesus. It's in him. It's not in our circumstances. We are all capable of rejoicing in Jesus regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the situation that we're facing, regardless of how we feel. We're all capable of rejoicing in Jesus and the reason is given. Because the Lord is near. Verse five, God is near to us. He is, he is near to us eschatologically. He's near to us personally. And because the Lord is near, you can rejoice in him. And not only can you rejoice, see, not only can you rejoice, it's a command. I, I, I don't get it with people. I don't like Christianity. I don't like to be commanded to do something. Yeah, commanded not to commit adultery, commanded not to steal, commanded to rejoice. The result is that rejoicing in verse 5 is to let a gentle spirit be known to all men. That's what comes from your rejoicing. Why? Because it's the antithesis of an anxious spirit. That's what a rejoicing spirit is. It's the opposite of it. An anxious spirit is a kind spirit. It's a, did I say an anxious spirit is a kind spirit? How many of you are listening? Did I say that? No, that's not what you want. You don't want an anxious spirit and say it's kind. I can be anxious. 
it's the kindest thing for me to do to people who need to see me being honest to myself. Don't be ridiculous. You don't want to be honest to yourself. Do you know what an, an anxious spirit is? It's not a, an anxious spirit. That, we think of it as just being torn up, but what the tor torn up leads to is, is a person who, think about the anxious people you know, nagging, whining, always complaining about things, upset, they're dominating, trying to get people to do what they want them to do, the subjugating spirit, that's the kind of spirit. But you see, a gentle spirit is controlled by God. God controls a gentle spirit, not trying to control all things by one's own power and prestige or person or influence. It says in verse 6, be anxious for nothing. You know, that is an extremely powerful statement. The verse does not say, be, do not, be anxious about the things that are worthy of anxiety. God is saying that nothing is worthy of being anxious about. Nothing. Nothing is worthy of being torn up about. But, well, maybe you say, what about if someone I love dies? Well, then you grieve, but not as those who have no hope. There's no reason to be anxious if the person is dead. They're already dead. There's nothing that your anxiety can do to bring them back. It's not going to give the person an extra moment of life. So be anxious for absolutely nothing. Don't even give yourself an opportunity to say, but this is so bad. I have the right to be anxious. You don't. Instead, what verse 6 says is this. Instead, everyone should know the words that follow without even necessarily having your Bible open or knowing what I'm about to say. Have these next words. If you don't have anything else memorized from tonight, memorize these words. With, instead, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. In other words, anxiety indicates that something is not right in your life that something is missing. God is not saying, I'm going to deal with those things, and you shouldn't deal with those things. No, God is saying, I, I want you to know what you, I want to know what your requests are, but here's how I want to know, not by your anxiety, I want to know by your what? Your prayers, I want you to pray, I want you to speak to me, I want you to bring them to me prayerfully. Once you're prayerful, you're out of the state of anxiety. You can't be anxious and be praying to God at the same time, really praying when you're, if you're continuing to choose anxiety. Because anxiety is saying, I've got to control this. I've got to get this under control myself. I have to be in control of that situation. I feel out of control. I've got to get back. No, you're not praying and getting into control at the same time. God is saying, bring your concerns, bring your request, bring them to me in prayer, and let it be prayer with specific requests but then he gives the mindset, and this is the mindset you need throughout your life. It's a mindset of thanksgiving. I believe that one of the great sins of the people of God is thanklessness and ingratitude. Think, for example, one of the situations and uh, illustrations in the scriptures that just is overwhelming to me. Ten lepers were healed by Jesus. Nine of them went away. Only one said, thank you. Only one. The Lord is saying that our attitude in facing circumstances that are naturally anxiety provoking is to have instead an attitude of gratitude. Instead of anxiety, an attitude of gratitude that you need to be thankful. Think about this when you deal with people in your life. Say to them, thank you so much when someone does something or helps you. On the, on the ride here, uh, Skip and Eileen and I were talking about different kinds of people that we, we say thank you to or should say thank you to. Do you know one of the things I do when, when we put out the garbage by our house, and at times I see the garbage man, you know, maybe a quarter mile or even a half a mile away, I'll just wait a minute or two. And when he picks up, I'll talk with him and I'll say, by the way, thank you so much. I really, I really appreciate you picking up my garbage. And uh, he's looking at me. It's like strange. I, I don't hear that. But every now and then I'll say that to him. I won't do it every week or anything of that nature. But I want him to know I'm thankful. And I, you know why I'm, I am thankful. Think about if he didn't pick up your garbage and just was left there. What would you do? Eat it? <laughs> Burn it in the city or something? You know, so it, 
thankfulness from the littlest things to the big things with God and all things with thanksgiving. Show, we, we, don't, we don't thank people enough. We were talking about the soldiers. When you see a soldier ever saying, hey, thank you for what you're doing. You're, you're helping keep us, keeping us safe. We don't stop for these people who are impacting our lives. And here's God who's not impacted just our life, our eternity. And we're anxious. I haven't got time to pray, God. I've got to get this worked out first. This is what God wants you to have when facing the cares of your lives, an attitude of gratitude and thanksgiving to God. So instead of being anxious, you're to rejoice in the Lord. You're to know that the Lord is near. You're to have a gentle spirit. You're to present your requests, your concerns to God in prayer. You're to have an attitude of thanksgiving. And then God says that you're also to have a biblical focus. And that biblical focus is seen in verse 8. That focus is to be the Bible, whatever is true, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is beautiful. Do you want to stop being anxious? Here's what God is saying. Make sure that what you think about is good and right and true and lovely. If you start thinking evil and rotten and nasty and gossipy and slanderous and condemning thoughts, your life is going to reflect that kind of thinking. But God is saying, instead, let the words that leave your lips which will reflect your heart, be only what is good, what's true, what's right. Try this. Try this when you leave here. Try to not say anything that is not good, that means bad, that, about a situation or someone. Don't, or don't say it. If you can't say something that's good, don't say it. Now, something critical or speaking realistically about a situation can be something good. Depends how you say it. If you're attempting to resolve a situation. But you know what I'm talking about, just being critical. Did you see the way he or she did that or said that or look at that person? That's the kind of stuff. You don't want to live that way. You don't want to have your mind, your thoughts, your words, your relationships filled up with ugliness. Imagine if you just followed this in terms of your life. Only what's good and true and beautiful and excellent and above uh, all reproach, those are the only things that you bring out of your mouth coming from your heart. When you live just complaining negatively about a situation or a person, it's, it'll, it'll destroy you more than the other person. Stop it. God is saying when you live that way, you're going to be anxious. But don't just stop it. Instead, stop it and replace it with the things that are good and beautiful and right and true. If you can't say something good about someone or something that's going to be edifying and instructive, be quiet. Keep quiet and don't say anything. Instead, try and say something good and lovely and true and beautiful. It can be a difficult thing to say, but it can still be good and true and beautiful. Something that's going to build up a person. I remember I had a few people. I didn't know what it was. They could say something that was, could hurt me and get right deep inside of me. But they said it, it was true, it was right, and in a sense, lovely, and it, I used to feel, thank you, thank you for that. I didn't know why, because it seemed like it should hurt and be bad, but it wasn't, because it was true. And you be careful even when you do it, so you do it in a way that's not meant to harm the person when you're saying it. It's done in the right kind of way as well, with a gentle spirit. And then there is also an action focus with which we replace anxiety. Not only are you have a thankful focus and a biblical focus, but you're also to have an action focus. In Philippians 4.9, we read, the things you learn, received, and heard, and seen in me, these things do. In other words, you have mentors, you have pastors, you have Christian parents, you have a Christian uh, husband, a Christian wife, you have Christian friends who have given you godly examples, the things you've learned that are good and right and true and beautiful, you've learned them from someone. The things you've heard that are good and right and true and beautiful, you're applying now to yourself that you've gotten from other people, the things you've learned and received and seen in me, in your family, in people whom you respect, in Jesus Christ, in the Bible. These are the things to do. Those are the things. Don't look for examples that are treacherous, that are wretched and lawless and awful. Don't imitate the things 
that are ugly. Don't pick up and copy the slang, the vulgarity, the slothfulness, the carelessness, the tardiness, the lawlessness, the ineffectuality, the sinfulness that's inappropriate and ugly. Don't pick up those things. Pick up and copy the things that will make you into truly sanctified, godly men and godly women. God is saying that this is going to break through the anxiety. When you're living a life focused on God and on what is good, when you're not just thinking but also doing these things, there's going to be no room for anxiety. You see, the first part is to think about these things. The second part is to do these things. Put them into practice. Have a list of things that you need to do that are good and right and beautiful and true. If it's something that you, you're called to do and it's good to do it, then do it. Put it into action. Don't wait. Because if you don't put it into action, then you're just going to start making excuses to yourself. And instead of a biblically action-focused, action-oriented life, it's going to be an excuse-filled life. I have a very busy life. But you know something? I've made a commitment, and this is what it is. If the Lord puts on my heart to call someone, I don't say, okay, I'm going to do that, and I write it down. I don't do that. I'll stop. I will make that call I'll even say to myself, I'll feel myself saying it, you're in the middle of working on a message or you have a class tonight that you have to teach, finish the class first. And I have to say to myself, no, no, you know your commitment. Do it now. And do it. And do it at that point. When you don't do it then, you won't do it later. If you manage to escape doing it when there's a commitment on your heart to do it and you won't find yourself doing it later. If there's someone, I, I mentioned making a telephone call. It could be visiting a neighbor. It could be writing a card for someone. It could be doing, shoveling the snow from the, the, the old lady next door. You know, there's tons of things that come to us that are put on our hearts by God, and we just avoid it and move on. Finally, we're to repla replace anxiety with a Godward focus. At the end of that verse, in Philippians 4.9, it says, and the God of peace will be with you. You see, anxiety is the antithesis of peace. Anxiety is to be torn apart. Earlier in this passage, in verse 7, it was the peace of God that is to guard us. Now, in verse 9, it's the God of peace himself who is with us. When you're living this way, God himself is with you. And both God's peace and the God of peace himself will be with you. He will bring you peace in your life. You won't be torn apart because you won't be living a torn apart life. I want to wrap it up, and as we close, I want us to go back to where we started and look once again to Peter, where he says, cast your anxieties on God, 1 Peter 5, 7. The word cast that Peter used means to throw. You are to throw your anxieties on God. See, it's an echo of Psalm 55, verse 22, where the psalmist says, cast your burdens on the Lord and he will sustain you. In 1 Peter, Peter, a man who was killed for his faith in Jesus, says, cast all of your cares on the Lord, and it's the right thing to do because he cares for you. Paul, who is another martyr for Jesus, says, don't be anxious about these things, but rejoice in the Lord all the time. You see, friends, I would say this to you, put your faith to work. You all have things that you can be anxious about if you want to be anxious. We could be anxious right now. I could mention a word, Let's start with one word and go through 10 of them. Money, um, marriage, children. You know, in five minutes I can have you forgetting everything else I've said except those three words or a few more that I could throw in there. No, I mean, it's, of course. Put your faith to work. You have things to be anxious about if you want to be anxious, if you want to choose anxiety. Each one of you can instead believe God, you can trust God, and you have a choice, anxiety or faith. And I urge you, don't be anxious, but instead cast your anxieties on him and instead live by faith. But you can't live by faith if you don't have faith. And that means, if there's any, any of you sitting here tonight, maybe a friend brought you, I don't know. If you don't belong to him, I call you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. 
God commands all people everywhere to repent. I call you to repent of your sin. Your sin especially, you might think, oh, my this or that isn't that bad, but your unbelief is horrible. It's horrible because he's the God of heaven and earth. I call you to trust him, to cast not only your cares, but your entire being upon him because he cares for you. Trust him for the salvation that he promises to all who have faith in his name. And then you're going to find that in the midst of the many, many struggles that you're facing, and some of them you're facing right now or that you're going to face soon before you even know it, you're going to be able to join with Peter, with Paul, with all the others who have cast all of their anxieties on Jesus, knowing that he truly cares for them. And likewise, you see, you too can remember who you are, that you are then sons and daughters of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You too can put into action those things which are good and right and true and beautiful. You too can have a spirit of gentleness. You too can cast all your anxieties on Jesus knowing that he truly cares for you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you that our cares can be brought right to you, thrown upon you, because you care for us. We thank you that there is nothing that is too great of a care that you wouldn't bear it and take that burden from us and help us to rejoice in the Lord always. Thank you, Lord, that we can do this that our life is not determined by our circumstances, it's determined by your love. And your love covers a multitude, it says, of sins. And we think of it only in terms of the things we do, but it's not. It covers a multitude, perhaps, of sins that will be hurled at us by those who might hate us and enable us instead to face life and face others and face even our enemies with the holy boldness of Christ and the love of God and the and the concern and care and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Lord, be with us. Be with each person here. And if any needs that saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I pray that you wouldn't even let that person leave tonight before finding that truth in, in Christ. Thank you for this time we've had. Give others a good night's rest. And may we continue with your blessing upon us in the morning. In Jesus' name, amen.